Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. So my name is John R. Smith, and I'm an IBM Fellow and a member of the IBM Academy. And today it's my pleasure to talk to you today about teaching computers to see. Before I dive into the topic, I do want to thank the many contributors to, to this topic, which includes the Multimedia Research Group. It includes the Computer Vision Group, as well as some collaborators at universities. So let me start by motivating the topic. Well, image and video data is everywhere. So all of us have smartphones. All of us are taking pictures. In fact, today we're taking pictures at the rate of one trillion photos per year. And there are two billion smartphones that are out there. So if you look at uh, a typical gathering today, it's really an enormous amount of data that's being acquired. And I really like this one, even this girl here Looks like she's drinking a Coke. It's actually a phone, so. Um, and all of this is producing a tremendous amount of data, and we're consuming it. So today, all of us are watching at least one hour of digital video per day, and this is in addition to the three hours of TV or other content we watch. So in fact, we can say that massive multimedia may be the biggest wave of all. And certainly, if we look historically, over different waves of information technology, well, for many decades, the focus was structured data. And that drove problems around data management, transactions, uh, big data analytics, and so on. And then recently, text became quite important. But we can see that perhaps in the, in the, in the big picture here, video data, image data, audio, its combination of multimedia may be the biggest wave of all. And we're seeing this in so many different industries. Everything from safety and security problems, the medical domain, uh, consumer content, the media industry, uh, overhead imagery from drones, uh, enterprise, digital marketing, and so on. So this is clearly big data. But it's big data in the sense, not that there's just a lot of it, but there's big data because this is really an opportunity to apply analytics and to extract information and insights from the data. However, if we look at the challenges associated with this kind of analytics, uh, they're actually quite substantial because we need a sophistication of algorithms. So we need to be able to turn that data into features. We need to build models on top of that. And this is something that's really uh, requiring something which is beyond even what we've done with, with text. If we look at sort of a back of the envelope calculation, what does this mean in terms of computation? Um, we may say that if we're analyzing the movie version of a story or the book version of the same story, it's a thousand times more computation to essentially go through the video scene by scene to, to understand the content. So uh, given that explosion of data, I just wanted to walk through a few different motivating use cases. Um, and we can see that there's really tremendous opportunity here. The first one I'll start with is essentially uh, exploiting the huge amount of growing data that's in social media. And we're seeing in, in lots of different online sites, uh, sharing sites, and so on, like Facebook, uh, like Instagram, like Pinterest, and so on, uh, we're getting an extraordinary amount of image and video data uploaded there. A lot of this information is being shared openly and being made public, and it actually provides enormous opportunity for extracting insights over these different streams. So for example, uh, take a person here, Jane, who posts her photos on Instagram on some regular basis. By using computer algorithms that can go through her photo stream, we can understand things about Jane. For example, uh, perhaps she has, uh, she's, she's fond of designer handbags of a particular kind, or she likes to travel, or she's a pet owner, or perhaps there's a, a, a new baby in her, in her life. All this kind of information is really very valuable for marketing, for delivering promotions, uh, advertising, and, and so on. And it's something that the computer can help to extract the, the insights. Another example is around uh, law enforcement. So traditionally, there has been a lot of work to analyze video from cameras, um, which are often stationary cameras in places like, uh, like cities. At the same time, there's been a lot of interest to understand images as they relate to security events and, and so on. However, where we see big challenges coming is around uh, mobile cameras. 
and body-worn cameras in law enforcement. And these are introducing substantial new requirements for the computers because we have to deal now with content that is dynamic and cameras that are moving and so on. At the same time, we'd like to get a lot of information out of these video streams in terms of understanding uh, the people in them, uh, their activities, understanding uh, the motion content and the activities and behaviors that are taking place. And there's a tremendous amount of this data being generated. We want to understand, uh, we want to be able to summarize the data, efficiently go to uh, the points of, of most interest. So that's another motivating use case. Uh, I just want to talk about uh, two more which are in the area of healthcare. Images are a huge part of, uh, of the field of medicine and of healthcare. And there's also tremendous opportunity here for using computer learning to essentially extract information about the images in, in this domain. One example that I show here is, is in skin cancer. So skin cancer is uh, a deadly disease. It's, it's the most common form of cancer in, in the US. And it's something where early detection is actually a key. Uh, with early detection, the prognosis is, is actually very good. Um, but it's also an area where the human analysis of these photos is really not very good. Um, so when there's an, uh, an image taken of a skin lesion and a clinician looks at this, this image, their ability to correctly diagnose from that image uh, varies greatly and depends a lot on their experience with, with the images. But it's a space where we can begin a journey using uh, visual learning technology to essentially go from a process that has traditionally been manual in terms of characterizing these lesions to one where we use some amount of data combined with human engineering to create a system uh, to one where we use an unprecedented amount of training data to essentially teach the computer what matters in diagnosing uh, the disease from, from these images. Uh, the last one I'll just mention here is, is also in the medical space, but it relates to knowledge that's being accumulated uh, through journal articles and reports and, and so on. And one motivating use case is around um, PubMed and the millions of articles that are getting collected there and, and made searchable. Again, images are a big part of all of this knowledge and it's a place where we can use computer technology to essentially go through the figures and the images that are in these, uh, in these articles and understand them better and relate them to the important concepts that are being discussed in these articles. It's one place where we have done some uh, work and have gotten very strong results by essentially training the computer algorithm to understand different kinds of images that appear in these articles. And in combination with the captions of these articles, uh, provide a very uh, strong uh, result in, in correctly classifying uh, these, these figures and making those documents more searchable in a multimodal way. So if, if I put all of these together, um, where these use cases are taking us is to essentially a, a brand new space in, in visual uh, learning and recognition. So traditionally, uh, computer vision systems have addressed a narrow domain. Uh, they have uh, basically required a lot of human expertise in creating the algorithms and as a result have only been able to address really a small number of entities in terms of what they, they could recognize. Through uh, data-driven learning at a scale that we haven't seen before, it's getting us into a space here in which we can have a very broad coverage of uh, different domains and different uh, semantic entities that can be recognized. And um, it's allowing these new use cases, for example, that, that I discussed, where the computer is providing substantial uh, new value around image and video data. So I wanted to go through some of the technology that underlies um, you know, all of these important trends and just start by putting this in a context of, so what are we really asking the, the computer to do here? Well, essentially, the problem that the computer is faced with, uh, we can call bridging the semantic gap. So image and video data is really not naturally self-describing. You have uh, pixels um, that display in a screen. Um, so it's not something that's easy to directly search against. So you know, essentially, the, the challenge is to turn those images and, and videos into a set of 
uh, labels um, you know, that are at the semantic level. This has been something that for uh, people is very easy. Even a small child has a remarkable ability to recognize the contents of, of the visual world. But it's something where, the, where computers have actually um, you know, b been very challenged to produce that same kind of capability. And traditionally, the way the computer has succeeded is by making the domain more narrow, putting in more constraints around um, you know, uh, what the tasks are uh, in terms of recognition. Um, however, uh, taking approaches uh, today using machine learning is, is giving us a new way to address this problem, uh, essentially through data and algorithms. And you know, one way to think about this one is, so we have the images and videos, we want to produce these semantic uh, labels, so what do we work on in between? And that's essentially two uh, important layers here. So the first is a set of features that we can use to represent the content of these images and videos. And that can include everything from ways to describe color, texture, edges, shape, motion, and so on. But this gives us a space in which the computer can now uh, work with to uh, learn discrimination or, um, or to do uh, discovery of, of, uh, of important concepts. And it's in that space of models then where we can also have a lot of innovation in terms of uh, what are we actually going to train in terms of uh, connecting the features to these different semantic entities. So um, in this uh, journey around features, uh, there actually have been some really dramatic uh, developments recently. And if we think about the features, again, uh, there's a whole spectrum here. So we can, we can think about features that are explicitly engineered by computer vision experts. And then we can think at the other end of the spectrum, features which are learned essentially from, from data. And it's, it's moving towards uh, this end of the problem that by um, today, the greater availability of training data is allowing us to learn features that are turning out to perform better in systems than what the best computer vision experts have been able to come up with. And we see this trend in something called the uh, ImageNet large-scale visual re retrieval challenge. And if we look over the course of just the, the last couple of years, we can see dramatic improvements in terms of the uh, classification error rate um, on this particular challenge of classifying 1,000 uh, different uh, semantic uh, concepts. Um, and this has also provided a better localization capability, so in terms of detecting where objects are within a scene. Um, and uh, yeah, we can see another metric here. So this has really been a very powerful uh, development in, in the field of uh, computer vision. And it gives us also new opportunities um, that we haven't had before. So one, one example is around something we call transfer learning. So essentially, uh, because we can now train the computer to, uh, to learn these different features, um, once we have these features, we can go and do new tasks with them. And so that's actually been you know, very, very revealing. So one example is if we uh, learn features on that ImageNet data and then we go, a complete, uh, go and do a completely different task, which is around a different set of categories. Here it's called uh, Caltech 256. Um, but if we look at the performance that we can get by essentially taking uh, deep features learned from another data set and then go and do this task, we're getting a substantial jump in performance of where state of the art uh, was just recently around uh, human engineered features. So this is really giving us a very powerful tool. Um, the other thing uh, which is very revealing here through experiments is that these same learned features can even do very different tasks. So for example, taking those same ImageNet features and doing a task around video action recognition where we're looking at, well, what, is, what, are, what are the entities actually doing within the video scene? Uh, similarly, uh, putting those deep features in combination with some other things, uh, we can get a substantial um, improvement in the performance in terms of recognizing these actions. So this is really very strong evidence that uh, through data and through these algorithms, the computer is able to learn something which is really quite powerful in creating these systems. So I wanted to go through, uh, in the last part here, some examples of where we're applying this technology and showing some, some demos. 
Uh, so the first thing I'll talk about here is a capability uh, called visual recognition, which is in IBM uh, Watson Developer Cloud today. And it's uh, one set of services that complements other things in Watson Developer Cloud around speech transcription and language translation and text-to-speech and, and so on. Essentially, the visual recognition capability allow somebody to bring unknown images and videos to the service, and then the service will essentially uh, label uh, that data for them. Um, we, we see this visual recognition capability having a very important role uh, among developers, um, among uh, ecosystem partners for IBM's uh, Watson, and you know, essentially it allows uh, you know, different applications and solutions and developers to bring content to the service, and that service will bring back metadata that they can then use in their applications. And this can be, this can be used to support a variety of different applications, plus it also gives us an opportunity to uh, work with more data and to improve our algorithms, um, you know, over time. Uh, a few examples of the services that are being developed um, well, one is a, is a core service around visual recognition, which is, uh, which is at a beta status in Watson Developer Cloud today. That allows uh, somebody to bring unknown images to that service, and the service produces labels. There's a variety of different things that uh, IBM Research is working on to enhance this service. For example, to do uh, text recognition within uh, the visual scenes to support face recognition, to support visual search, and so on. Uh, but the learning component is also a big part of this. Essentially, it allows uh, someone to bring new training data to the service, and a model will be learned from that training data and then made available. And there are also opportunities to build on top of this visual recognition capability. For example, in the earlier uh, slide I gave around uh, getting insights about Jane's photo stream. Well, that's exactly the kind of thing we imagine developers and ecosystem partners will, will want to do. So I just want to go through some example and demo here and then, and then conclude. Uh, so there is one demo application in the Watson Developer Cloud today around visual recognition. Essentially, it allows someone to bring any kind of unknown image uh, that is uploaded, the image is analyzed, and uh, the system returns a set of uh, labels and scores with, um, so that are associated with, with that image. And there is a vocabulary of um, approximately 1,000 of these labels built into the system today, and that's a target that we're working to increase over time. I wanted to show a demo, uh, two demos here. The first one that I'll show is around the learning side. So how we can bring uh, new training data to, to the service and then even iterate with the service over multiple sessions to have the, the service essentially learn a model over the data. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm gonna show here is, um, essentially this is a drag and drop panel. And the column on the left here labeled positive is where we put our positive training images for what we're trying to learn. And the column on the right, which is labeled the negative panel, is where we bring our, our negative images. And so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna train a classifier uh, for leopards versus tigers, okay? So what I do simply is um, bring the leopards to the left column and the tigers to the right column, and I'll call this uh, leopard and say learn. So what the system um, you know, is, is doing here, uh, it sends those images to the server. Um, the server is uh, essentially processing each of those images in terms of extracting the features, and then it's building a model over, a discriminative model over those features that essentially separates these two categories, and it's telling us the result here. So you can see we're getting you know, a pretty good separation here of leopards versus tigers. Uh, lots of tigers down here, lots of leopards there. We can see this one is actually a tiger, so uh, that one is not correct. And it's saying here, here are a few which it's most uncertain about. Um, so, of course, any learning session we do, the computer may not be perfect, and that's, you know, th that's what we expect. Um, so, but what we can do here is we can, we can continue to iterate with the computer. So essentially we'll give it a test. So I'll 
drag a whole bunch of unknown images to the service here. And this is a mix of leopards and tigers. And we'll see how well uh, the computer can deal with this new data that it hasn't seen before. OK, so we'll give it a second here. And essentially, what it's trying to uh, return us whoops, with here is uh, its classification of, of leopards versus tigers. And you can see it's actually doing quite well. Leopards here, tigers here. If we look at the, the boundary, um, well, there may be some um, you know, close ones here. So what I can say is provide feedback for learning and we can uh, then iterate with, with the system. So uh, this one down here is um, really a leopard. Um, this one is a leopard. This is a leopard. Um, I think the rest are correct. OK, now here's another one on the boundary. So what I'm essentially doing is telling the computer, OK, here are the mistakes you made. Uh, go back and relearn. And what the computer is going to do is take these, uh, this new labeled input from the user, and it's going to refine the, the model. Um, and then we'll get to see you know, uh, how well this model is. So we're getting you know, uh, a, a, an improved result here. We can see the region of uncertainty is getting smaller. That's the yellow area right in the middle. And the results are getting better. So there's um, total ability to keep iterating with this. So we can keep going through many sessions with with um, uh, a human you know, over time and keep iterating and refining our model over, over these, these sessions. So um, the last thing I'll just show you here before concluding is um, just some of the variety that we can support in terms of what this service can recognize. I just dragged a whole bunch of different kinds of images here. Um, this one is actually running there in the background. What I do, think I'll do here to speed it up is just jump to the pre-baked results here. Um, so we can see for, for each of these images that got uploaded, uh, the, the computer's labeling them you know, with varying confidence between 0 and 1. 0 0.5 is sort of the decision boundary. Um, and it's labeling these images from a whole bunch of different perspectives. It's looking at different activities, different objects, different uh, people-related categories, and so on. And you can see we're really getting you know, pretty good results for you know, for this labeling of images. So let me come back and conclude here. OK, so yeah, so the system has learned uh, thousands of these concepts. And you know, we can even go into special domains like animals. You know, tell us what animal this is, or tell us what food this is, or tell us what sport um, you know, this is. So um, just concluding here, um, image and video data is, is growing. Um, and uh, not just in volume, but also in importance. And uh, all of the manual processes that we can think of for tagging this content and making it searchable simply will not scale uh, to this great amount of data. Uh, but machine learning is giving us a very powerful tool that is creating breakthroughs here in computer vision. Um, so what we're seeing is a, uh, an important trend here from uh, expert computer vision driven uh, solutions to one that are relying much more on data-driven learning techniques. And this is being made possible by uh, the same uh, great increase in data, um, image and video data. Um, there are lots of future directions here. So much more work is needed around the, the semantic modeling of, of all of this. So we can, we can work to bridge the semantic gap, but we need to know where should this bridge lead to? Lead to. What is on the other side? Uh, so we need a lot more work around how do we build a semantic model of the visual world? What en entities matter? How do we train a system to recognize all of them? And we also need much more work on the dynamic and temporal aspects of this visual content. So uh, images are great, but a lot of what's uh, important is video. So we need to be able to model and understand the, the video content as well. So I think on that point, I'll conclude. So thank you very much.